So hi, Kate, and thank you very, very much for agreeing to talk to me about yourself, your life, your experiences for this instalment of Inspirational Women. Um, so for those who don't know you, haven't seen you on this platform before, could you give a really quick introduction to who you are? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Kate. Uh, I would always say, firstly, I'm a passionate linguist with a real interest in the Nordic countries, and that's one strong theme that's gone through my life. Professionally, I spent 20 years at British Airways, went on to work at Century Health as Chief Customer Officer, and I'm really interested in working with commercial businesses on how to do good business that make money, but also take the interests of colleagues and customers and the wider community to heart. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Kate, if I may, I'm going to read verbatim from your LinkedIn profile because you talked about Scandinavia and there's something here that really uh, dazzles me, which is you speak fluent Danish, good Icelandic and Norwegian, some Finnish, understand Swedish, in addition speak good French, some Spanish and German. I mean, that to most people is, is mind-blowing, me included. I, I learned a little bit of French in my last role and got to a sort of okay conversational standard, but it was painful. I mean, you studied ancient Nordic at university, is that correct? Yeah, so I did a degree in French, Danish and Old Icelandic. Wow. Uh, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend as a combination to anyone else. Um, but, but for me, it was fantastic. And it proved a springboard into all sorts of other opportunities that I could never have dreamed of when I, when I started out on that path. So did you find that obviously learning that first language to a really, really good level, sort of hardwired your brain for the acquisition of new languages? Does it become easier with each subsequent language? Well, I, I think so. I, I was incredibly lucky, so I got the chance to learn French when I was very young and went out to France on holiday, so also got the chance to apply it. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, it's very well evidenced that it's easier to learn when learning isn't just theoretical. You also get the chance to, to apply it to something and practice in situ. Yeah. Um, and um, I think it's absolutely true that having learned it and discovered that I loved it and um, really started to understand that languages give you access to different people and different cultures and perspectives mm. in a whole new way, I then was just thirsty to learn new languages. I do think the more you learn, the easier it gets. Um, but I did a lot of my learning, I must say. Um, I mean, not so much at school, obviously, but when I was older, by just hanging out in European countries and having interesting conversations with people. Quite yeah. often there would be a beer involved. Excellent. Um, so, you know, I, I just learned it by osmosis because I loved it. I mean, I have huge admiration for people who learn to be an astrophysicist or, I don't know, a doctor or somebody who really, really had to sit and, and study. I, I just mm. happened on a passion um, for something that I was good at and enabled me to travel and meet other people and do things that I love. So what could be better? Yeah, no, it sounds incredible. And you know, you loved it so much. You studied three separate, so you studied in Iceland, you studied at Cambridge, and I've forgotten the third institution, forgive me, but you studied- Oh, Copenhagen. Fine, so you liked it so much, you actually studied three separate degrees on, on, on linguistics, which is amazing. Um, you know, when you finished that fairly long stint in academia, did you kind of look at it and go, right, now, where do I, how do I apply this? How do I make a living from this? Because it's, it's quite a niche thing, isn't it, speaking a language? You can become a lecturer or, or a translator, I guess, or you can go and work in that country, but you still need a, a sector, a, a, an area to work in. So how did you decide what to do? Yeah, look, look very niche. And uh, look, my poor father was horrified when I announced I was going to do a degree in Danish. And Danish is, you know, and Icelandic, of all the languages, are as you know particularly niche. There's not a huge call for them. Um, but I pursued them not because I could see a job opportunity, but because I loved them. Um, eventually, of course, I had to leave university and uh, started looking for a career. And at that point, I was actually in Copenhagen, mm. uh, and so I started applying for jobs in Denmark. Uh, and I uh, applied successfully for a job that turned out to be working for British Airways in a contact centre where they were looking for people with language skills. So ironically, the, uh, the thing that uh, was my entry point to a 20-year career with British Airways that ended up in very senior posts running very big budgets uh, was the fact that I had learned Finnish along the way. 
because I was the only applicant out of 500 who was able to bring a combination of English, Finnish and Copenhagen, uh, and Danish rather. I'm not so uh, and so that's, that's how I got the job, not because I was yeah. passionate about airlines or customer service, but because it was a job where I could use that combination of languages. Okay, so we'll talk more in a second about the roles, um, you know, particularly the kind of the, the senior customer roles that you held at the British Airways. I think a lot of people would be really interested to, to hear about that. But do you think there's a case to be made based on your own experience is that if you don't really know what to do, just do something you love, find something you love and pursue it with passion. And actually you probably won't go far wrong because you're likely to be good at it. And if, if nothing else, you're going to enjoy it. Um, I, I definitely think so. Uh, I mean, if your circumstances permit you to do that, of course, and I was lucky that mine did, but I think it's absolutely true that you will in general be better in life at the things that you're genuinely passionate about and I also think that if you are happy and enjoying what you're doing and thriving in what you're doing you're going to be more open to the opportunities that present themselves as you go along the way and so I would I would advocate that and I would say to people uh, that if I could build a career out of a degree in French Danish and Old Icelandic <laughs> you could almost certainly build a career out of pursuing your passion. And, and you know talk, talk to everyone a little bit about your long and, and, and like you said illustrious career in, in British Airways you started out in a role sorry you didn't say exactly what the role was that you, you started out in so what was the role you took on in terms of so I, I started out literally at entry level when British Airways was starting its frequent flyer program in Scandinavia mm. uh, I was a customer service agent uh, on the phones uh, I helped build the IKEA desks that were the office furniture uh, I used to stamp the fulfillment packages every month. Um, it really was sort of, uh, yeah, absolutely entry level customer service over the phone, uh, answering correspondence um, role. But it was a fantastic entry into the world of airlines. Yeah. Um, I mean, perfect for me. It was a brilliant brand, really. You know, British Airways was at the height of its brand prestige as the world's favourite airline. Mm. Uh, and it got me talking to customers. And I loved that customer engagement. And I, I still do. Thank you. And, and, and obviously your, your intellect and your ability and your application um, are the sort of root cause of your ascent to that organisation. But you rose at a time, I guess, when gender equality wasn't so prominent as it is today. It was hard to get on into senior roles. So do you sort of look back at that and, and, and attribute some of that rise to any particular leader or manager who kind of helped or not helped, but facilitated you making the most of your abilities? Well, I mean, I, mean, I think I would go back to the point um, partly that I started my career at British Airways in Denmark uh, and I then went on to lead British Airways commercial activity in Norway for three and a half years. And uh, the Nordic societies uh, are in a very different place, or certainly were in a very different place in terms of their attitudes to uh, gender equality. Mm. So in 1975, the Icelandic women all went on strike for a day, uh, whether they were in paid employment or whether they were working domestically in the home. They went on strike for a day to campaign for gender pay equality. And the first Icelandic legislation on gender pay equality was passed the following year, yeah? In Norway, uh, the uh, maternity leave allowance is 49 weeks on 100% pay, or 59 weeks on 80% pay. That's incredible, isn't it? When I moved, when I took my first role with British Airways in head office, I can remember the manager saying to me, you know, this is your package, blah, blah, blah. If you're going to have children, we have very generous maternity provision. And I laughed at him. I said, if I was going to have children, I would not be leaving Norway. And so, you know, to an extent, I think I'm very blessed that for the first eight years of my career, albeit that I was working in the British company, I was working in a culture where there was absolutely no question mm. about uh, the right for women to participate equally in the workplace. Yeah. Uh, and um, that sort of stuck, that stuck with me. So why would I question it? Why do you think it is culturally or, or historically that we seem to be lagging behind a lot of certainly Western and, and Northern Europe um, in, in things like gender equality, certainly maternity, 
uh, leave and maternity pay, you know, it's not rocket science, is it? You know, if you want if you want women to, to work and then come back to work and be have equal opportunities, then equitable parental leave is a, is a kind of a, a must have. So why are we so far behind? With that? Yeah, I, and I don't know that I'm I'm qualified to comment on that. I, I would say that I can see some clear differences between Nordic society and British society, mm. which may have been at the heart of it. I think one of the things that um, I'm very drawn to in terms of their leadership and their culture is that they place, I think, far more value on on the collective and the well-being of the community mm. relative to the success to individual success than we do here in the UK. Yeah, women are a massively important part of our community, so you can't be a society that genuinely cares about the well-being and thriving of everybody if you then run a set of policies that deliberately um, or um, you know consequentially exclude 50 percent of the population yeah. so i do think there is just a very common thread around giving the collective well-being uh, a higher priority uh, being less hierarchical so a very different form of power structure and that probably lends itself to more of this sort of inclusiveness yeah so what was the longest stint you spent working in any um, in any given Scandinavian country before returning to the UK for work? Uh, so I spent five years working in Denmark. And how was that return, you know, you said for, from quite a liberal forward thinking nation to, to the UK? I don't want to say we're not, but let's say we're not as forward thinking as that in certain areas. Was that a bit of a, a bit of a shock to the system after, after those years away? Well, I think if you speak to anyone who has spent a long period overseas, and by the time I came back, I had been away probably 10 or 11 years, it is a culture shock coming back to your own country. So I definitely remember sort of coming home and expecting to feel at home because, you know, I'm British, this is where I grew up, and yet feeling slightly odd because I had some different attitudes, I developed some different habits. Um, I'd entirely lost 10 years of pop culture. Mm. So never ever do a pub quiz with me about culture of the 1990s because yeah. I, I cannot talk to you about what was on TV, I don't know who the right were. <laughs> I, I just have this cultural vacuum in my life um, <laughs> for, for that piece and you don't realise how much of that is the oil that fuels conversations. Yeah, and, social cohesion. Um, social cohesion. So yeah, so it was definitely a culture shock and it took me, uh, took me quite a long time to get used to it. On the upside, I was working in an office again that had bacon sandwiches for breakfast, and I, I viewed that as a positive improvement. But um, yeah, it takes a bit of time to adjust, I think. Yeah, but I mean, clearly you didn't let that that culture shock slow you down. And I guess if there was any, what well, did you find any reactions from from your male peers and colleagues to you having worked in an environment that was quite egalitarian? I guess did you find them sort of raising an eyebrow to your approach to, to them and to business in general, or not so much? No. I recall but then I was transferring into another role um, in the same organization and working with a lot of people that I had known when I was um, over in Scandinavia you know I was blessed I had a lot of very supportive colleagues uh, at British Airways and it never really never really felt like an issue you're now back living in the UK I assume I, I, I guess I haven't actually asked you that question I assume you're living permanently in the UK again now I am yes I've been here for uh, Goodness, 20 years. Uh, I only meant to come back for two years, so I'm not quite sure how that happened. So do you think there's one more, one more adventure back into that part of the world for you, or do you think you might you know, end up well, there? Maybe. I, I'm still in touch with a lot of people there, and I visit regularly. I mean, we talked earlier about the sort of priority of um, the collective or the community, and I have to say I'm now very, um, I'm very fond and very embedded in my local community here in Hampshire. So, uh, you know, in some ways I'm happy to, to stay put. But if the right opportunity came back, yeah, I could be tempted back. Have you noticed a resurgence in, in that kind of community? Has the community been more prevalent in your, in your day-to-day -day life as a result of sort of the deprivations of certain other aspects of our life? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's one of the most interesting aspects of the current situation. I think there have been fantastic examples of local communities, whether they're villages or streets or virtual communities pulling together to help each other. Mm. Um, I know certainly when I was in self-isolation at the beginning of the lockdown period, 
Uh, I relied on my neighbour to a degree that I've never relied on um, her before because I needed her to go shopping for me. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's formed some bonds that uh, probably weren't there before and that will stay. Mm. I'm also really fascinated and heartened by the way that local businesses have rallied and uh, innovated to broaden their range of services and think about how they continue to uh, look after customers locally. And I very much hope that as consumers, we will remember that and continue to support those businesses in the future. And I think it's fascinating to see some very big businesses thinking about how to apply their resources and their capabilities to serving societal challenges in a way that they weren't previously doing. And I think it will be really interesting to see how many of them retain uh, a greater element of that in the future. I also think it's interesting, by the way, that there is far more debate about and, and focus on how companies are treating their employees than there is uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, clearly there's been a fair amount of scrutiny of how businesses are behaving with their supply chain in third world countries and a little bit about Amazon and warehouses. Uh, but the average consumer hasn't spent very much time, I suspect, thinking about how, um, you know, they're, the companies that they do business with are treating their employees. And as we move through this period, and companies are making decisions about who to furlough and how to furlough and where to lose jobs. I think, um, you know, their values with regards to employee value propositions are coming very sharply into focus. And you're really starting to see uh, who actually does what they say uh, and who's just been playing out a marketing line that actually doesn't have those values at their core. One thing I'd like to ask you as well, I've, I've seen obviously huge amounts of debate about what people miss from the old world, let's call it, but I saw a really interesting question earlier today actually, which was someone saying, what are you going to miss about the way things are now when we go back to normal or, or the new normal? So is there anything that you think actually I quite like Quite like the way this is now and i'm maybe going to miss that when things go back to normal i quite like there not being so much traffic on the road so <laughs> uh, i've got the bicycle out again and um, cycling because it's a little bit less scary uh, without the cars on the road and um i i mean whether i miss it or not um i don't know because i don't know how much it will change but i am certainly enjoying how open and available people are to connect and talk uh, and I mean, I reflect on conversations like this, Dan, and I don't know sort of six months ago whether we would have made the time to have the initial conversation that led to this session now. Yeah. Um, and I think there is so much power in just connecting with other people's views um, and experiences, and I'm really enjoying that. Yeah, I think that's a great point, actually. And I don't know whether you've experienced the same, uh, uh, but I've seen perhaps a little bit more kindness just a bit more empathy online because the internet is a notoriously vicious place isn't it below the line but I've just generally sensed that people want to be supportive because everyone's having a bit of a tough time and maybe people are a bit ratty but there seems to be a collective kind of putting of, of the arms around around each other which I kind of hope that that sticks around yeah humanity is good it can be and I think we're certainly seeing some of the best of it um at the moment you know and and i hope that that element of realizing how much we need each other and how much how much of a, of a hole it leaves in our day-to-day -day lives when you can't see and physically put your arms around your loved ones you know i hope we kind of remember that and don't take it for granted because no one else in our lifetime no one else alive today has ever been through anything like this before in terms of the the, the, the physical isolation from other people yeah but I wonder, you know, fundamentally, I am a great believer in um, people and, the, you know, the vast majority of people that I have met in my life across many cultures have been good, decent people who I have liked mm -hmm. uh, and who are genuinely motivated to help. And I was reading quite an interesting article yesterday. They said on average, people underestimate by about 50% the likelihood that other people will help them. Wow. Um, um, I, I'm just not sure that we always stop to look for those examples when we're very busy living daily life. I think now in this situation, there is more of an appetite to hear those stories mm. because everything else feels so grim. Yeah. But, but before COVID and after COVID, there were millions of people doing amazing things every day on a more or less altruistic basis. Yeah. We just didn't stop to look for them. 
No, I really like that that message, um, Kate. And I think I, I'm sort of of a view that there are no inherently good or bad people. There are just kind of good or bad actions. And some people do more of one than the other. And, and I wonder how much of your experience is linked to your outlook on life. You know, when you meet people, if you assume they're going to be good and kind and, and, and altruistic, maybe that brings out the best in them. Whereas, you know, sometimes if you're a little bit sceptical or a little bit, um, a little bit negative in your approach to someone, you probably aren't going to see their best side. So there's a lesson there that I'm clumsily trying to sort of draw out. But I think, you know, people will kind of give you what you expect of them almost. Well, I, I think that's a point well made. I can remember doing some work with an executive coach a little bit uh, some time ago. And we were talking about a relationship with someone who I fundamentally liked but found quite difficult in a, in a business context. And I often found that we got into quite confrontational um, conversations. And as so often, I was doing the whole, oh, they're difficult. Why can't they be different? And, and he looked at me and said, you know, Kate, the only person you can change is yourself. Mm. And if you change yourself and you change um, kind of your intention and your expectations going into that conversation, it will change your actions. And if you change your actions, it will change the response you get back. So, you know, one of the kind of common threads, given the, the title of this series is Inspirational Women, um, is feminism, women's issues, gender equality, etc. So, you know, what's your, what's your view on, on feminism? Is it necessary? Is it outdated? Has it served its purpose? Where, where, where do you kind of stand on, on the big issue of feminism? Oh, blimey, that's a big question. Um, where do I stand on the issue of feminism? I mean, what I, what I do think is that there are clearly still inequalities in the world. And some of those are gender inequalities, but not all of them. There are, um, you know, all sorts of terrible inequalities um, on this earth. And so I think there is work for us all to do, men or women, um, to understand and mitigate those where we can um, and I very deliberately say men or women I think where the term feminism can be unhelpful is if it is associated with an adversarial position of women versus men or men versus women I, I just think that that's not helpful but there is clearly work to do so you just need to look at the stats on gender pay or um, you know linked to that the um, spread of women at different levels in organizations um, and you can see that there are issues and that's an issue for all of us because there is also increasingly well documented evidence that the best teams make the best decisions are very diverse teams. Absolutely. Um, so it's in all of our interests to, to build a more diverse approach to managing our businesses and running our countries um, and building our communities to be resilient for the future. Yeah, well, I, I completely agree. You know, you, you only need to look at when you have a homogenous gene pool, you end up with stunted, um, you know, evolutionary parts. And I think that's exactly the same for um for, for the boardroom you want as diverse a skill set and, and, a, and a background and gender and race etc in there as possible because otherwise you end up serving a tiny sector of, of the community or the customer base that you're that you're focusing on you know if yeah. for reason that it's just the right thing to do if you look at it purely from a commercial perspective it makes good business sense in my mind yes and you know businesses are you know businesses there's nothing wrong with thinking about these things from the commercial perspective Mm. Um, but I genuinely do think it makes good sense um, to bring in more diversity. I've just finished reading Matthew Syed's book about rebel thinking, which is, um, you know, a great exposition of the power of diverse thinking. And he tells a story about the CIA in the run up to 9-11 mm. um, and, you know, argues that one of the reasons that the Twin Towers ultimately happened was the fact that just about everybody in the CIA was a white middle aged man. Uh, and Christian, importantly, in this context, yeah. and so therefore completely failed to, to read and understand the importance and the symbolism of any of the messages coming out of Al Qaeda, and sort of dismissed it as you know strange Middle Eastern babbling. Whereas actually, if you looked at it through the right lens, you would have understood it um, to have far more significance. And you know, 
boy, did it have significance. Yeah. Well, and that, yeah, you say feminism is a big topic, and that's probably um, equally uh, <laughs> equally challenging topic to take on, isn't it? But um, no, uh, yeah, I think you make a really a really good point. Um, and you know, something else you said to me before when we had a quick chat a, a couple of weeks ago was about the the power of kindness. Um, and you sent over a really interesting podcast, which I listened to actually found found hugely informative. But I kind of feel like it sounds mega cheesy. I can't believe I'm going to say it, but kindness is the cure to, to all these sort of societal ills that we face at the moment. And we, I think, prior to this, we we were or have been quite a divided society along sort of political lines, um, you know, for 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 a while. And people won't always get things right. People will make mistakes. But if you can try and approach everything with kindness, you're probably going to do okay. Aren't you? That, that's kind of my view. And and this concept you sent over was the, the physical power to the individual of kindness. So, you know, that, that was a really interesting idea to me. Is that something you, you've you come across before or, you, or you're quite kind of keyed into? Because I've never heard of that before. Uh, I, I think um, that was new in terms of the physical benefits. But there's a lot of things I've been reading and listening to um, that, that talk about the sort of just the benefits of a positive attitude and, and kindness and being grateful um, for what you got. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I think there, there are situations where it's right to, um, you know, to test the facts and to be questioning, and sometimes you're right to be worried about what's going on. Um, but I'm not sure there are many situations when being unkind um, is helpful. And I was brought up, you know, in British Airways with a culture in a business context that always said you do the right thing for the business, but in the right way for the people. Uh, and people, people really, really matter. Yeah. I had a great experience on a British Airways flight, actually. And it was entirely because the person I was flying with um, had gold avios membership um and, and it was a completely unique experience to me because obviously you go through the, the the first class lounge at heathrow and it's very nice and he had a gold card mm -hmm. which you get to give to people for, for particularly good service and, and he got you know brilliant service from from this uh, uh woman that was working behind the, the check-in desk and he gave her he said i'm going to give you my my gold card and she came running out from behind the desk, gave him a great big hug, got people to take their, their picture. She was so chuffed to get this, this gold card. And I didn't really know what was going on. I was completely confused by the whole situation, but it was just such a lovely moment. Um, and, and, you know, I think because of that, I would only ever fly British Airways Transatlantic again because it was just such a nice human moment. Well, I can't tell you how happy that makes me because they're golden tickets and my team were involved in... Um we set up the, the whole initiative. Um, but, but it's all about, I mean, that, that absolutely is about reinforcing and recognising great service behaviour. So recognise the thing that you want to encourage. Yeah. Um, but also about that understanding that psychology that it feels great to do great things for other people. So your, you know, your friend got a real buzz out of it. Yeah. But the really interesting thing for me is, you know, we we used to run sort of quarterly events for uh, colleagues who'd been given golden tickets mm. and I would talk to them. And without fail, they all say, would all say it was lovely, but I don't understand why I got one because wow. uh, I was just doing what anybody would do. Um, you know, I would be like that with anyone. And I think, you know, the thing that was exceptional about all of them was that that great service came instinctively mm. and they did it because it came naturally and they felt great about it and when they felt great their customers felt great yeah and then it was a great flight and having worked as cabin crew i can tell you being stuck on an aircraft with a group with a group of customers who who don't feel great about it is not a lot of fun so no. um but that's an amazing like you, you could do you know a high, and you probably have you could do a whole a day-long week-long session about that exact point because you know it's a chicken and egg scenario because actually great customer service delivering brilliant experience isn't instinctive to all people um so you know building that culture and having it be such an inherent part of your of your teams was it 
the hiring policy that you guys had to get those people for whom it was instinctive? Was it the training? Was it creating the culture? Was it a combination of everything? I mean, that's such an amazing thing to have a team who don't think they've done anything exceptional and they clearly have. Yeah, well, look, I mean, it, it was a holistic, it was a pretty holistic program. And I would say there are, um, there are absolutely a group of people, certainly where in British Airways are in many organisations, I'm sure, to whom it simply does come naturally. And yeah, you can look at your recruitment processes to kind of try and optimise the likelihood that you're going to get those people. But there are just some people who are natural sort of service givers. Mm -hmm. There is a group of people in the middle who, given the right incentives and the right environment, are more likely to give great service than not, but they can probably be nudged in either direction. Um, so thinking about those nudges um, is really important. And then there are some people who are just probably not going to do it and they're not in the right place. And then you can have a conversation with them about where the right place is for them. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's about a whole combination of factors. It's about, it's about how you recruit, it's about how you reward people. It's about the signals you send as a leadership team. Mm. It's about the environment you create um, in which your people are delivering. Yeah. So one of the most powerful things I did at British Airways as a senior executive was to train as cabin crew. And I used to go and fly as cabin crew. So put on the uniform, fly as cabin crew every uh, 90 days. And I would introduce myself for who I was at the beginning of flight. And for the rest of the flight, I would work as the most junior crew member on board. Mm. Uh, and people would say, oh, that's amazing. You can see the customer experience. And of course it was. But the really interesting thing was seeing the colleague experience. Mm. And actually starting to think about how some of the actions that, um, you know, we potentially weren't looking for, weren't driven by what the individual colleagues wanted to do, but they were driven by the tools and the processes and the decisions mm -hmm. that management had made back in head office. So we weren't giving them a chance to show their best if we weren't giving them uh, the tools they needed to do the job. Yeah. Or you know, equipment that worked, or creating processes that empowered them to make the right decisions in the moment, because with the best will in the world, things happen that you just can't script for yeah. uh, when you're writing the management manual. So if you're in a world where you're not empowering your people to make intelligent decisions, and you're not celebrating them when they do, mm. what's the incentive for them to do it? You know, I've seen programs where companies have you know, wanted uh, colleagues to do something good, and yet their focus has been on putting in audit programs to catch them out when they do it badly. Wrong. Yeah. Wrong. And, the result, and the result is they don't move off square one because it's yeah. safer to do nothing. But it's so interesting, isn't it? People are looking at the same problem, but they're looking at it from completely opposite ends. You know, one's looking at, right, how do we reward the good? And the other is looking at how do we punish the bad? And, and it's so clear which one is more powerful. Yeah, so you focus on the result you want to get, right? yeah or you get the result that you focus on yeah amazing and i'm mindful of um of sounding like a kiss ass Kate, but it sounds like you would have been really really good to work for with that kind of um approach you know we our business is is customer experience as well and i think it's fantastic that cx is becoming more prevalent in businesses but i still feel like a lot of companies don't start with the the, you know, the kind of right approach which is you've got to make the uh, you've got to make your team happy first. You've got to make your people, your staff happy first, because miserable and undervalued employees cannot deliver a great customer experience. They can robotically go through a really good process, but they're never going to deliver an experience that makes customers go, "Wow, that was amazing!" Like my example of my friend um, when when we flew to the states together. If they're not happy, if they're not enjoying their job, and it sounds like you kind of embrace that. Yeah, spot on. I mean, I think the culture is is so important and it starts and it starts from the top and it's about every aspect of your business. It's not just about the CX department and journey mapping. Mm. It's about, you know, where you spend your focus. It's about what the metrics are you look at. If you say you're passionate about customers as a management team, how much time do you spend talking about and talking to your customers? How much time do you spend talking to the people in your organisation who spend the most time with you? Or do you spend all of your time looking at the spreadsheets? Yeah. Yeah. So let's say that your, your next challenge 
you know, you're, you're, you're obviously in a customer facing role, but you're building up a, 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 the, the customer strategy from scratch. What, and I don't want to be too reductive because I know it's a very complex, um, a very complex system that you have to put around the business to make CX work. But would you have a, a golden rule on the wall? Would you have a sort of, uh, you know, thou shalt always do this? Or do you not, do you not think it can be expressed so simply? Well, I'm not sure one rule would do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I think, I mean, certainly if you're going into a new business, um, I would say start by listening. Mm. To everyone, to, to your colleagues, to your customers. Yeah, everyone, but particularly your customers and particularly the people who are talking to your customers every single day. I think that's a great point. And, you know, is there, in your experience, is there a good way to, to elicit that kind of, that, that huge depth of knowledge that, that, that your team have got? Because, like you said, if you're asking a boardroom of people to make a decision when you've got a thousand colleagues working on the problem on a day to day basis, and you're not talking to them, you're missing out on the real knowledge. What was it? And how do you get people engaged? How do you get people feeling like they want to give their opinion, that their opinion is going to be heard and listened to? And you tap well, into I, I think the first thing you've got to do is to show up and be visible. So if you do it early, you know, I guarantee you in most businesses, they will not have seen a senior executive arrive in the business and get to spend time with them in that way mm. early on in their career um, too often. So, so you will stand out. So if you, and if you're going to talk about it, do it. So do it and do it visibly and then pick a couple of things and fix them because, you know, one of the things that people who work with me get sick and tired of hearing is me saying people believe what you do, not what you say. Mm. So if you're going to set yourself up as someone who's going to listen and act on the feedback, listen and act on the feedback. So pick things you can do quickly. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're not going to move the needle enormously in terms of customer experience or customer reaction. The thing that matters is that you do it, you do it quickly and you talk about it because then you build the belief of your people. Yeah. Uh, and then you can start that whole flywheel going. And then you need to start thinking about how you sort of manage to do it at scale and all of those things can come further down the line. But, but you know, set out with your intent uh, and, and act accordingly. Okay, is there anything else that you, um, you know, you're really passionate about, you'd really like to get out there? If there's anyone watching, you know, I think people are, are, are drawing more and more, uh, than, well, more than ever before, sort of strength and hope from what online content they can find because they can't physically go and hear it from anybody. You know, is there anything that you found really useful or you really like or you'd like anybody to think about, you know, now or, or indeed at any, any time? Yeah, I suppose... Um, so two things we were talking earlier about kindness um and how good it feels to help and i think one tip uh, that it might be useful to share is what i learned about networking mm. uh, and i think networking can have such terrible uh, connotations uh, and yet when you're looking for a role everybody tells you that it's all about the network and you've got to network mm. when i started doing it I was truly amazed and humbled by how many people on my immediate network, but also people I'd never really met before, were both willing and able to help me. Um, and it was an amazing experience. But the thing that really unlocked networking for me was when I worked out that the key, great, the key to great networking is to approach it not from a perspective of what can the other people do to help you, but what can you do to help them. The John F. Kennedy approach. <laughs> well, I, maybe. I didn't know he'd done it. But, but to me, it was game changing. Yeah. Um, to think about it from that perspective. Uh, and then you've got nothing to lose. Uh, and again, it's about the intent that you start out with when you start that networking. And if you approach it with an open intent and in the spirit of curiosity and how can I help you, you might just be surprised by what wonderful things come back. So that might be a useful tip for people who find themselves uh, potentially suddenly in the position of having to network and look for roles yeah. uh, unexpectedly as a result of this crisis. 
the other big learning I would say that came to me late in my career is the power of asking for what you want. Uh, so I had a fantastic career at British Airways and uh, got to do all sorts of amazing roles. Uh, and for many years I would have told you that that was because I was lucky. Uh, the reality is luck's helpful, but I was asked to do those roles because I was capable of doing those roles and I was delivering and people saw that potential in me. Mm. And the greatest role for me that I ever did at British Airways, which was heading up the Global Product and Service Division, uh, came about because for the first time uh, I put up my hand and I asked my boss um, for advice and I told her that I wanted the promotion and I wanted to go for a bigger role mm -hmm. and it was the first time that I didn't rely on luck that I actually made that move myself and it was a brilliant move uh, and if I'd have known how powerful it could have been I might well have done it earlier <laughs> so uh, so I'd like to share that with people uh, now yeah. so, so you can learn it earlier in your careers both fantastic pieces of advice um, Kate and, and I hope people well, listen to that um, and I think certainly I don't know whether again I'm, I'm uh, my own unconscious biases at play here but I think certainly women that I've known uh, professionally have felt less empowered to ask for things in their career I don't know whether that's changing now I hope it is certainly my wife has, has, has struggled to go and ask for a promotion or a pay rise and I've had to kind of say look you're definitely worth it if it was me I'd be in there asking for this six months ago um, so yeah I hope people listen to that and, and take a and take your strength away from it so thank you very much yeah, you're welcome there's this um, scary bit of uh, harvard business review research isn't there that women um on average look to match themselves to something like 80 to 100 percent of the required skills in a role before they feel confident applying mm. uh, and men start applying somewhere between 40 and 60 percent so uh, <laughs> Yeah. There's a whole load of very qualified women out there squeezing themselves out of opportunities. I know. And a whole lot of less qualified men who are um, gaily applying. So yeah. you could do a whole you, you can could fix a whole that. white paper on that, couldn't you? The, 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 everything at play behind that is just so complex. But like I said, so depressing um, that, that women would look at something and go, I'm not perfect, so I'm not going to apply. And, and a large number of men will look at it and go, oh, I can blag it when I get there. And that's, um, <laughs> I've done that. I, I know I've applied for roles. I've probably got roles that I, on paper, couldn't, didn't have the experience and qualifications to do. But, um, you know, I was chatting with Claire Sewell um, earlier on uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she said, well, she's a big proponent of helping women uh, overcome imposter syndrome. Um, and I think everyone, anyone can feel imposter syndrome, but it does seem to be, for, for whatever reason or set of reasons, more prevalent within, within women, within female professionals. Yeah, but I do hope it's changing. I can remember as a child sitting on the sofa with my mother watching um, them bury the year 2000 box on Blue Peter <laughs> and being absolutely convinced that when they dug it up, I would be sitting on a sofa with my children watching that happen. Mm. because I didn't know women who had careers mm. uh, and, and my nieces now who are you know in their late teens and early 20s they won't be growing up um, with those sorts of assumptions so yeah. you know, I think it's changing there's more change that needs to come yeah uh, but I think a lot of people have worked hard to get us to where we are now uh, and there are lots of inspiring examples that show us where we can get to so um well, like you said, like yourself, Kate, you know, I have to say, you know, you've, um, you've, you've no doubt inspired a lot of the people that you've worked with or that have worked for you. And, um, I, yeah, I'm really grateful that you, you joined us tonight and shared some of your experiences. And I could have talked to you for hours, so I've had to cut it, um, cut it short. But, you know, really, really appreciate you, your, your time and your insights. And I'm sure whatever challenge you do take on next, uh, you'll, you'll smash it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, my pleasure. Nice to talk to you, Dan. And stay in touch. Will do.